Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim by Robert C. O'Brien. Day 10. Would you tell us, as well as you can remember it, word for word, that what Mr. Fitzgibbon said about the rats, about the men who were at the store? As well as I can remember it, Mrs. Frisbee's voice sounded small in the big room. Mr. Fitzgibbon said a strange thing had happened in the hardware store. Henderson's, he called it. Her memory was good. She had listened with great care to what Mr. Fitzgibbon had said, and she was able to recall the whole conversation word for word. The rats sat quietly while she told it. Then Nicodemus went back over it, asking questions. You say that Mr. Fitzgibbon said six or seven rats. Did he ever say which number it really was? No, I don't think he paid much attention to the number. Jenner's group was seven, said Justin, but it could be a coincidence. Did he say how far away the town was where this happened, or did he name it? No, but it must not be very far. He'd been there and back that day. Did anyone see his car go out? Nicodemus asked the others. I heard it, Brutus said. I was on duty. It went after lunch. And he was back by dinner? But which direction? If we knew, we might send someone, you see, Nicodemus explained to Mrs. Frisbee. We need to know who's, who those men are. If they're from Nim, things are much worse for us. We'd never make it, said Arthur. Driving at, say, 40 or 50 miles an hour, Mr. Fitzgibbon might have gone 15 or 20 miles in any direction and returned easily the same afternoon on the map. There was a road on the table. You can see it. You could have been any <coughs> any one of half a dozen small towns, and each of them might have a hardware store. You're right, of course, said Nicodemus. Without the name, that idea is hopeless. He turned back to Mrs. Frisbee. Mr. Fitzgibbon said the rats were grouped around the motor, as if they were trying to move it. That's what he said. The store owner told him. He didn't see it himself. And that the motor was plugged in? Had been left plugged in, Mrs. Frisbee quoted. But we don't know who plugged it in. I got the impression, Mrs. Frisbee said, from the way he said it, that the store owner had left it plugged in. But I'm not sure. That would make sense, Arthur said. If it was Jenner, and if they had plugged it in themselves, they'd have known better than to try to move it. So they must not have realized. It was probably better or pretty dark in the store. Poor Jenner, said Nicodemus. I wish he had stayed with us. It will be poor us, said one of the rats at the table. Mrs. Frisbee did not know his name. If we don't get on the, on with this. He did not mention the doctor's name, Nicodemus said. Did he say even a word about what he looked like? No. Did he describe the truck at all? No. Only that it was full of equipment. Are you sure about the headline in the local newspaper? Mechanized rats invade hardware store? I'm sure that's what Mr. Fitzgibbon said it was, but I don't think he saw it. He didn't say so. In a way, that's the most puzzling thing about the whole story, Nicodemus said. Why is that? asked Justin. Because the headline doesn't really fit the facts. You don't call a bunch of dead rats mechanized just because you find them on a shelf near a motor. Maybe not, said the nameless rat. But then why did the newspaper say that? I'm wondering, Nicodemus said, if perhaps there wasn't more to the story. Some stranger or stronger reason to think they were really taking the motor away or that they knew how to use it. Maybe some other motors had been stolen, Justin said, or some tools. That would make them seem mechanized. It would, said Nicodemus, and it would explain what the doctor meant when he said they had more checking to do in town. They're looking for things that were missing, Arthur said, sounding suddenly worried. They're looking for Jenner's headquarters, and if they find it, we're just guessing, of course, Nicodemus said, but it's a possibility, and a bad one. It means, Nicodemus continued, that we have no choice. We've got to assume they're from Nim. We've also got to assume that by now they may have found Jenner's headquarters, whatever cave or cavern they were using. And, said Justin, that now they're looking for us. Why for us? asked one of the rats. Why wouldn't they think Jenner's group are the only ones? They might, Nicodemus admitted, but I don't think so. After all, they know that there were 20 of us originally. Why should there be only seven now? And we already know that they're coming out here, in quite a hurry at that. So if they're from Nim, obviously they are looking for us. I think, said Arthur, that we've got to make some plans, and quickly. I agree, said Nicodemus. It's a new situation and a tricky one. We won't be able to do everything we hope to. There isn't time, and somehow we have to convince the exterminators, when they come, that we aren't more of the mechanized rats they're looking for. We won't be able to move any more food to Thorn Valley. <coughs> Nicodemus continued. We've We'll all have to get along what 
we've already got stored there. About 18 months supply, if we're careful. The seeds, I believe, are already moved. Yes, said Arthur. The last load went yesterday. So with luck, we'll have our own first crops this summer and fall. We won't have time to destroy the motors or the books or the furniture as we planned. Instead, we'll move everything to the cave. And then we'll seal off all entrances to the cave as if it had never existed. That can be done, Arthur said. But there's more. We've got to pull all the wires and lights from the tunnel. They're likely to dig it up. And the carpet. We've got to tear down the ark. Then, when it's, all that's done, when everything is hidden in the cave, we'll fill in the stairway in the elevator shaft. We'll seal off everything except the upper storage room and the tunnels leading in the front and out the back. When they dig, let them find that room. It's as big as an ordinary rat hole. Justin, tonight, take a group of dozen or so. Go to the Fitzgibbons garbage can. Bring back a load of the worst smelling garbage you can find. The storage room is going to become an ordinary, typical rat hole, not in the least mechanized or civilized. Nicodemus turned to Arthur. What do you think? I think we can do it all. We won't get much sleep, though, Justin said. But there's one more thing. Won't they think it's odd, especially if they're from Nim, finding just an empty hole? Nicodemus said. I was coming to that. He sounded suddenly very tired. Tomorrow morning, as soon as it's light, the main group leaves for Thorn Valley. But some of us will have to stay behind. As Justin says, if they find just an empty hole, they're sure to be suspicious, and they'll keep on digging. So when they come with their gas truck, they've got to find some rats here. A rear guard. I'd say at least ten. Mrs. Frisbee walked slowly home, keeping to the edge of the woods, keeping out of sight. Justin had instantly volunteered for the rear guard. Brutus was second, and behind him eight more. There were fifty more waiting behind them. Enough, enough, said Nicodemus. Isabella, in tears, had run forward. I want to stay, please. She had pleaded, looking despairingly at Justin. No, children, said Nicodemus, and her mother led her away, still weeping. Those ten, the ten who would remain, did not face certain death, nor certain capture. The exterminators, they presumed, would make noise, especially if they cleared away the rose bush. The rats would be alerted. When the men pumped gas, as expected, into the hole, the pump would also make a noise. The air below would move as the gas flowed in. When they felt that... The rats would scramble out the back exit, past the <coughs> sealed-off cave, emerge as noisily as possible in the blackberry bramble, indeed show themselves, and dash off into the woods. Or won't they block the rear exit? Or put a net over it? We'll give them another rear exit to block, Arthur said cryptically, one that's easier to find. Mother, why are you so quiet? asked Teresa. They were sitting down to dinner for the first time in their newly moved house. You seem sad. I suppose I am, Mrs. Frisbee said because the rats are all going away. But that's no reason. It's true, they moved our house, and that was nice of them, but we really, <clears throat> but we didn't really know them. I was getting to know them pretty well. Where are they going? Cynthia asked. To a new home, a long way away. When? Tomorrow morning. Will you go to see them off? I think I will. But why are they moving away? Asked Timothy. Because they want to, said Mrs. Frisbee. Someday soon, she would tell them the whole story, but not that time. The doctor. The next mo morning, Mr. Fitzgibbon started the larger of his two tractors, the huge one he kept in the barn, the one that pulled the combine in the fall harvest. With help from Paul and Billy, he bolted the big bulldozer blade to the front of it, rumbled it through the barnyard gate, and stopped it near the rose bush. Well, well, wait until they come, he said, turning off the engine. Mrs. Frisbee could not bear to watch, and yet, even more, she could not bear not to watch. She knew there was nothing to be gained by it, nothing she could do. Yet how could she stay at home when the rat, ten rats, including Justin and Brutus, were waiting bravely underground? She could not. She thought at first of her watch hole in the corner post. Then she decided against it. Nearer to the rose bush on the edge of the woods stood a hickory tree, its scaly bark like a ladder, inviting her to climb. Ten feet up on this tree, a large branch jutted straight out. On this branch, up close to the trunk, she had a vantage point from which <coughs> herself unseen could look down on the rose bush and also see into the woods to a blackberry bramble where, though she had never been in it, she was sure the rat's rear exit must be hidden. She settled down to wait. It was a chilly morning, with a damp breeze and a gray mist that blew by in patches. Somewhere near the middle of the morning, a square white truck came into the driveway. It went first to the house. A man in a white coverall uniform climbed out and knocked on the Fitzgibbon's door. It was too far away for Mrs. Frisbee to hear the knock or to hear what the man said when Mrs. Fitzgibbon came out on the porch. But ten seconds later, Billy ran from the house to the barn where Mr. Fitzgibbon was working. 
The man returned to the truck and waited, standing outside the open cab door. Through the windshield, she could see the two more men sat in the front seat, and that one of them worn, wore horn-rimmed glasses. Now Mr. Fitzgibbon approached the truck, Billy dancing beside him, apparently in some excitement. There was a conference, none of which Mrs. Frisbee could hear, accompanied by gestures toward the rose bush and the waiting bulldozer. The man in the white climbed back into the driver's seat and drove the truck across the grass. He backed it up beside the bulldozer, stopping perhaps ten feet from the bush. Mrs. Frisbee stared at it. If there was anything printed on it, it must be on the other side, away from her. Then three men climbed out, and she could hear what they said. It's a big one, all right, said one of the men. And look at those thorns. It's hard to see how even a rat could get in there. The man in the horned rims walked around the edge of the bush, examining it closely. He bent over. Look at this, he said. There's the entrance hole, very neatly hidden. And look behind it, a path leading in. He turned to Mr. Fitzgibbon, who had walked up with Billy. You were right. You'll need to bulldoze it. It would take us all day to hack our way in there. But cut it off just at the surface if you can. If you dig too deep and open the hole, they'll get away. He added, better tell the boy to keep back. We'll be using cyanide, and it's dangerous. Billy, after some argument, was dispatched to the back porch where Mrs. Fitzgibbon was also watching. One of the men had walked around to the far side of the bush, the side near Mrs. Frisbee's tree. Doc, he called, here's another entrance in the bush, and there's a hole just inside it. Doc was the man in the horn rims. He was a doctor, Mrs. Frisbee thought. Doctor somebody. He was in charge. Can you get at it? He asked. Not very well. Too many thorns. The man who was a doctor walked around and looked at it. No, he said, anyway, that would be the escape hatch. We'll find the main hole near the middle of the bush. He turned to Mr. Fitzgibbon, who had mounted the tractor. Okay, said the doctor. Can you push it that way, away from the shed? Mr. Fitzgibbon nodded, and the motor started with a roar. He pulled a lever and flexed the heavy steel blade up and down, bringing the bottom edge to rest just even with the ground. The blade was fully eight feet across. He pulled another lever. The wheels, with cleated tires as tall as windows, dug in and the blade scraped forward. The bush fought back, then yielded angrily, snapping and crackling before the exorable thrust of steel. A single sweep and a third of it lay, a writhing heap of thorns in a pile twenty feet away. The ground trembled under the wheels and Mrs. Frisbee thought of the ten rats huddled below. Supposing the weight collapsed the earth, caved in the storage room and trapped them. Another sweep and a third. Only a thorny stubble now stood where the bush had been. On the porch, Mrs. Fitzgibbon covered her eyes with her hands, and Billy cheered in excitement. Plainly exposed were two holes, simple round rat holes. There was no trace of the small mound, nor the elegant arch entrance. Arthur had done his work thoroughly. Mrs. Frisbee wondered for a moment at the second hole. Then she remembered his saying, We'll give them another rear exit to block. Of course, they had dug another hole, most likely, she thought, just a dummy, leading nowhere. The men in the white suits went into action. The back doors of the trucks were opened and a long flexible pipe unrolled. It looked like a fire hose except that at the end, instead of a nozzle, there was a round plunger like a big rubber ball cut in half. One of the men donned a mask with a glass visor and a tube that ran to a pack on his back, a gas mask. The masked man pulled the hose over to the center rat hole and pressed the plunger over it, covering it completely. From the back of the truck, the other two took a large box made of wooden, wood and wire, almost a yard wide, and placed it over the second hole. It was a cage, but half of its bottom was a trap door, neatly mounted on hinges. This they raised, placing the open part directly over the opening in the earth. Then <coughs> they backed away, one of them holding a trip cord, which would close the trap door after the rats were inside. All set, the doctor called to the man in the mask. The mask nodded. Keep back now, said the doctor to Mr. Fitzgibbon, who had left his tractor to watch. He walked to the truck, reached inside, and turned to switch. Mrs. Frisbee heard the soft throb of a pump. Now, she turned and watched the blackberry bramble in the woods. Would they hear the pump? Where were they? Oh, let them come out. Almost a minute passed. The men in white watched the trap. Nothing moved. Then she saw it. Behind the bramble, half hidden by a swirl of mist, a gray-brown shape, a rat, shaking dirt from his ears. Another. Then three more. They huddled in silence, waiting. More. How many? Ten? Seven. Only seven. Where were the other three? Still, they waited. Then, as if by agreement, they stopped waiting. They ran, all seven of them, not back into the woods to the safety, but out of the woods toward the stubble of the rose bush, toward the men. At the edge of the bush, they stopped as if in confusion, ran to the left, ran to the right, and fled back into the woods again. 
Now they are out of sight of the men, but not of Mrs. Frisbee. Instantly they regrouped behind the blackberry bramble and charged out again, but this time in smaller numbers. First two, then three, then two again. She saw what they were up to. They were not in the least confused. They were making seven rats look like twenty rats, or forty. A steady stream of them. In the mist, in the hectic turning, running, turning, hiding, she could not tell where, whether or not she recognized any of them. The men shouted, Look at that! A pack of them! How did they get out? Get the nets! The doctor turned off the pump. The man with the hose pulled off his mask. As a new wave of rats danced along the edge of the clearing, all three men ran to the truck and from it pulled long-handled nets. While Mrs. Frisbee, up on her branch, was staring at the blackberry bush again, she saw something that all of the others, including the rats, did not see. An eighth rat had come out. He emerged running, but then he stumbled. He got up and ran again, this time more slowly, circling vaguely to the right. He did not seem to know where he was going. He reached a sparse thicket of saplings, almost out of her sight, and there abruptly he fell over on his side and lay still. Meanwhile, all three men holding their nets low ran across the stubble toward the parade of rats. But as they approached the parade, it vanished. The rats, their purpose accomplished, melted into the misty woods, and this time they did not reappear. Mrs. Frisbee watched them as they loped away swiftly in single file and disappeared from her view back into the deep forest and up the mountainside. The rear guard was gone, bound for Thorn Valley. But the eighth rat still lay unmoving among the saplings, and two had never come out at all. They're gone, said the man who had worn the mask. They fooled us. What happened? asked Mr. Fitzgibbon, standing near the truck. Simple enough, said the doctor. They had two escape holes, and they used the other one. He walked back to the blackberry bramble and bent down, kicking the branches aside with his foot. Here it is, he said. Quite a long tunnel. One of the longest I've seen. To the other two men, he said, get the pick and the shovels. For half an hour they dug, laying open a narrow trench along the tunnel. From her angle of view... In the tree, Mrs. Frisbee could only <clears throat> could see only the top of this trench and not down into the bottom. Still, she watched, saying to herself, perhaps all after all, there were only eight. Maybe they decided that eight would be enough. Then one of the shovels broke through into air. They had come to the rat's storage room. There's two of them, said one of the men, and her heart sank. Who were they? She wanted to run and look, but she did not dare. Careful, said the doctor. There may still be some gas in there. Let the wind blow it out. Phew, said one of the men. That's not gas. That's garbage. Open it up a little more, said the doctor. One of the men wielded a shovel for another minute, and then the doctor peered in. Garbage, he said. Last night's dinner. Garbage and two dead rats. Mr. Frisbee thought. He sounds disappointed. Only two? said Mr. Fitzgibbon. Yes. It's easy to see what happened. In a hole this size, there would have been a couple dozen at least. But these two must have been up at the front, near the tunnel. They got a whiff of the gas, and it killed killed them, but before they died, they must have warned the others, so the rest ran out. Warn them, said Mr. Fitzgibbon. Could they do that? Yes, said the doctor. They're intelligent animals. Some can do a great deal more than that. But he did not elaborate. Instead, he turned to one of the men. We might as well take these two back with us. From the truck, the man produced a white paper sack and a pair of plastic gloves. He pulled the gloves on and reached into the hole and placed the two dead rats into the sack. He did this with his back to Mrs. Frisbee so that she never got even a glimpse of them. All right, said the doctor. Let's close it up. They shoveled the dirt back into the trench and returned to the truck. You'll let me know if they have rabies, said Mr. Fitzgibbon. Rabies, said the doctor. Yes, of course, but I doubt it. They look perfectly healthy. Perfectly healthy, thought Mrs. Frisbee sadly, except for being dead. She looked into the woods over toward the saplings where the other rat lay. Was he, too, now dead? To her surprise, she saw that he was moving. Or was he? In the mist, it was hard to tell, but something had moved. After the truck had left, Mr. Fitzgibbon stood looking at the ruin of the rose bush. He seemed vaguely puzzled and disappointed. He must be wondering, she thought, whether it had been worth it just to exterminate two rats. He had no way of knowing, of course, that all the rest were also gone and would not return, that his grain loft was safe. In a moment, he turned and walked to the house. As soon as he was safely gone, Mrs. Frisbee scurried down from her tree and into the woods. On the ground, she could no longer see the rat or the thicket where he lay, but she knew the direction and she ran. Around a stump over a mound of leaves past the cedar tree, there were sa the saplings, and there lay the rat, still on his side. It was Brutus. Beside him, futilely trying to move him, stood Mr. Ages. She reached him, breathless from her run. Is he dead? No, he's unconscious, but he's alive and breathing. I think he'll revive if I can get just get him to swallow this. Mr. Ages indicated a small corked bottle, no bigger than a thimble, on the ground beside them. What is it? An antidote for the poison. We thought this might happen, so we got it ready last night. 
He got just a little of the gas, maybe made it this far, and then collapsed. <clears throat> Help me lift his head. Mr. Ages had been unable to lift Brutus's head and the bottle at the same time. Now, with Mrs. Frisbee's help, he forced open Brutus's mouth and poured in just a few drops of the smoky liquid the bottle contained. In a few seconds, Brutus made a gulping noise, swallowing hard, and spoke. It's dark, he said. I can't see. Open your eyes, said Mr. Ages. Brutus opened them and looked around. I'm out, he said. How did I get here? Don't you remember? No, wait. Yes. I was in a hole. I smelled gas. An awful, choking, sweet smell. I tried to run, but I stumbled over somebody lying on the floor and I fell down. I must have breathed some of the gas. I couldn't get up. And then, I heard the others running past me. I couldn't see them. It was darker than night. Then one of them ran into me and stopped. He puzzled, pulled me up, and I tried to run again, but I was still too dizzy. I, just, I kept falling. The other one helped me up again, and I went a few steps more. He kept pulling me and then pushing, and somehow, finally, I got to the end of the tunnel. I saw daylight, and the air smelled better, but there was nobody else there. I thought the others must have left, so I ran a little farther, and that's all I remember. Mrs. Frisbee said, What about the one who helped you? I don't know who it was. I couldn't see, and he didn't speak at all. I suppose he was trying to hold his breath. When we got near the end, I could see daylight. He gave me one last shove towards it, and he turned back. He went back? Yes. You see, there was still one rat back in there, the one I stumbled over. I think he went back to help that one. Whoever it was, said Mrs. Frisbee, he never came back out. He died in there. Whoever he was, said Mr. Ages, he was brave. Epilogue. A few days later, early in the morning, the plow came through the garden. Mrs. Frisbee heard the chug of the tractor and the soft scrape of the steel against the earth. She watched from just inside her front door, fearfully at first, but then with growing confidence. The owl and the rats had calculated wisely, and the nearest flower was more than two feet from her house. Behind the plow, in the moist and shining soil, the rudely upturned red-brown earthworms writhed in a frenzy to rebury themselves, hopping along each furrow a flock of spring robins tried to catch them before they slid from sight. And when the plow was done <clears throat> and the worms had all disappeared, either eaten or safely underground, Mr. Fitzgibbon came back with the harrow, breaking down the furrows and turned them all up again. It was a good day for the robins. After the harrow, for the next two days came the Fitzgibbons themselves, all four of them with hoes and bags of seeds, planting lettuce, beans, spinach, potatoes, corn, and mustard greens. Mrs. Frisbee and her family kept out of sight. Thoughtfully, Brutus and Arthur had dug their doorway behind a tuft of grass so that not even Billy noticed it. Brutus and Arthur. Mrs. Frisbee did not suppose she would ever see them, either of them again, nor Nicodemus, nor any of the others. Brutus, after swallowing Mr. Age's medicine and resting for half an hour, had gone on his way into the forest to join the colony in Thorn Valley. There was no talk of their coming back unless their attempt to grow their own food should fail, and she did not believe that would happen. They were too smart, and even if they did fail, they would probably not come back to Mr. Fitzgibbon's farm. She thought that it would be pleasant to visit them and see their new home, their small lake and their crops growing, but she had no idea where the valley was, and it would be, in any case, too long a journey for her and the children. So she could only wonder about them. Were they at that moment like the Fitzgibbons, planting seeds behind their own plow? Some, like Isabella's mother, might grumble about the hardness of the new life they had chosen. Yet the story of what had happened to Jenner and his friends, if it was Jenner and his friends, to say nothing of the destruction of their home, would surely help to convince them that Nicodemus' ideas were right. The Fitzgibbons finished their planting, and for a week or two all was quiet. But it would not stay that way. The crops would appear, the asparagus was ready to sprout, and for the rest of spring and summer the garden would be too busy a place for mice to live in comfortably. So on a day in May, as warm as summer, early in the morning, Mrs. Frisbee and her children laid a patchwork of sticks, grass, and leaves over the top of the entrance to their cinder block house, and then carefully scraped earth over it so that it would not show. With luck, they would not have to dig a new one <coughs> in the fall. They walked to their summer house, taking half a day to do it, strolling slowly and enjoying the fine weather, stopping on the way to eat some new spring leaves of field cress, some young pulp greens, and a crisp, spicy mushroom that had sprouted by the edge of the woods. For their main course, a little farther on, there was a whole field of winter wheat, its kernels newly ripe and soft. As they approached the brook toward the big tree in the hollow of whose roots they would make their summer home, the children ran ahead, shouting and laughing. Timothy ran with them, and Mrs. Frisbee was glad to see that he showed no trace of his sickness. It was an exciting time for them. In the garden, they were always alone with themselves, but along the bank of the brook in the summer lived five other mice families, all with children. 
Within a few minutes of arrival, her four had gone with a group of the others down to the water to see the tadpoles swim. Mrs. Frisbee set out the job of tidying up the house, which had acquired a carpet of dead leaves during the winter, and then bringing in a pile of soft green moss to serve as bedding for them all. The house was a roomy chamber with a pleasant earthy smell. Its floor was hard packed dirt and its wooden roof was an arched intertwining of roots above which rose the tree itself, an oak. On her way to get the moss, she came. She saw one of her neighbors, a lady mouse named Janice, who like herself had four children. Janice ran over to talk to her. You're so late getting here, she said. We all thought something must have happened to you. No, said Mrs. Frisbee, we're all fine. But don't you live in the garden, Janice persisted. I should have thought you'd be afraid of the plowing. As a matter of fact, Mrs. Frisbee explained, they didn't plow that the particular spot in the garden where we live. It's behind a boulder. You were lucky. That's true. More than that, Mrs. Frisbee did not tell. She had agreed to keep a secret, and she would do as she had said. Still, she thought after quite a long deliberation, it was probably all right to tell her children, first making them promise to keep it a secret. They were, after all, the children of Jonathan Frisbee. For all she knew, and for all Nicodemus knew, they were likely to turn out to be quite different from other mice, and they had a right to know the reason. The following evening, therefore, when they had finished an early supper, she gathered them around her. Children, I have a story to tell you, a long one. Oh, good, cried Cynthia. What kind of story? A true one. About your father and about the rats. How can it be about father and the rats? Teresa asked. Because he was a friend of theirs. He was? said Martin incredulously. I never knew that. Knew that. It was mostly before you were born. To everyone's surprise, Timothy said, I thought he might be. I think Mr. Ages was, too. How did you know that? I didn't know it. I just thought it. A couple of times I saw Mr. Ages leaving there in Rosebush, and I knew that Father used to visit him a lot. But I never <coughs> saw him near the Rosebush. Probably, Mrs. Frisbee thought, because he would have been careful always to leave through the Blackberry Bramble, just so we would not see him. That They sat down outside the entrance to the house and began, Beginning at the beginning with her first visit to the rats, she told them all that she had seen and done and all that Nicodemus had told her. It took a long time to tell it, and as she talked, the sun sank low, turning the red sky or sky red and lighting the tops of the mountains beyond which somewhere the rats of Nim were living. The children's eyes drew round when she told them about the escape from Nim, and even rounder when she described her own capture and escape from the birdcage. But in the end, the eyes of Teresa and Cynthia were filled with tears, and Martin and Timothy looked sad. Teresa said, but mother, that's terrible. It must have been Justin. He saved Brutus, and then he went back, and he was so nice. Mrs. Frisbee said, it may have been Justin. We can't be sure. It could have been one of the others. Martin said, I'm going to find out. I'm going to go to Thorn Valley somehow, someday. But it's too far, and you don't know where it is. No, but I'll bet Jeremy knows. Remember, he told you the rats had a clearing back in the hills. That must be in Thorn Valley. He thought about this for a minute, then he added, He might even fly me there on his back, the way he did you. But we don't know where Jeremy is, either. We don't see the crows down here, Mrs. Frisbee reminded him. No, but in the fall, when we go back to the garden, I could find him then. If I got something shiny and put it out in the sun, he'd come to get it. Martin was growing excited at this, his idea. Oh, Mother, may I? I don't know. I doubt that the rats will want visitors from the outside. They wouldn't mind. After all, you helped them, and so did Father, and I wouldn't do any harm. It's not something we have to decide tonight, said Mrs. Frisbee. I'll think about it, and now it's late. It's time for bed. The sun had set. They went in, into the house and lay down on the soft moss Mrs. Frisbee had placed on the floor of their room under the roots. Outside, the brook swam quietly through the woods, and up above them, the warm wind blew through the newly opened leaves of the big oak tree. They went to sleep.